The following program is sponsored by the American Legion family of Post 716 Los Alamitos, made up of veterans and their family members, supporting all veterans, active duty military, and local community programs. And by the Reserve Officers Association of the United States, Chapter 92 of the Department of the Golden West. I'm John Underwood. Welcome to Backstory, a program that attempts to look behind the headlines at the issues and events that affect our lives here in Orange County. Tonight, we're going to take a look back at what history and historians are beginning to call the most divisive chapter in the American century, the Vietnam War. The documentary producer Ken Burns, in the run-up to his uh, seminal 10-part series on Vietnam, had this to say about history. Sometimes you have to let a little history go by before you can objectively judge it. Well, he himself procrastinated over a decade before considering taking on the thorny issue of Vietnam. We're going to take a little piece of that history tonight and, uh, and hopefully personalize it with our in-studio guests. Uh, for this episode of Backstory, and they are on my left, uh, Milt Houghton. Milt, uh, retired uh, Lieutenant Colonel, United States Army Infantry. Correct. And uh, also uh, very active in an organization called the Reserve Officers Association of the United States. Right. I guess that keeps you pretty busy. Yes. And on my right, Tom Lasser, and some of you may uh, know Tom as the uh, former airfield commander at Los Alamitas uh, Air Base. Tom, also retired Lieutenant Colonel, United States Army, helicopter pilot. You guys have a lot in common, don't you? Both right. of you. Uh, obviously, as we said earlier, uh, Vietnam veterans. Both of you stationed uh, in the uh, I Corps zone that is up in the northern part of uh, Viet North South Vietnam, a uh, very active region uh, of, of the war. Um, both of you took on two tours of duty in Vietnam, uh, both of you with the AmeriCal Division. I, I think based out of Da Nang, or that area? Chulai. Chulai, yeah. very near Da Nang, uh, yes. the, the large supply center in, in North and South Vietnam. I want to be able to get your take, not the front page of the LA Times or off the back pages of the Orange County Register, but I want to know what you guys experienced in Vietnam. Um, you obviously both have a lot in common. You were in the same theater of war at the same time, albeit from a little bit different perspective, and therefore you both have a little bit different story to tell. And we're going to hear that story uh, very quickly. But I want to start off with some sobering statistics that, um, for what it's worth, remind us of what the Vietnam War was and for a lot of us still is. So, if you'll bear with me, by the end of the war for American ground troops in 1973, 2,790,000 Americans had served in Vietnam. 9.7% of their generation. Only 25% of them were draftees though. 58,148 were killed in Vietnam. 61% of them were under the age of 21. Three hundred and three thousand were wounded, seventy-five thousand of them severely disabled, with amputations occurring at a rate three hundred percent higher 
than in World War II. Missing in action, 2,338. 1,875 of them still missing to this day. In World War II, the average serviceman saw approximately 40 days of combat. In Vietnam, the average serviceman saw 240 days of combat. Two-thirds of all Vietnam vets have already passed away. Over 360 of them die every day. By 2025, it is estimated that there will be less than a few thousand left to talk about it. Fortunately for us, we have in the studio tonight two Vietnam vets who are able to talk about it and willing to talk about it and certainly qualified to talk about it. Gentlemen, Milt Houghton, Tom Lasser, let's talk about it. Yes, sir. Right. If I may, I'd like to begin with that quote at the top of the show, the Ken Burns quote. Yes. I'll just repeat it. Sometimes you have to let a little history go by before you can objectively judge it. Now we've had a little history go by, some 40 some odd years, we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War in a couple of years. I want to ask you both to start the program off has something changed in your minds when you mustered out of Vietnam, at least? You had a certain perspective on the place. I'm sure it left an impression. Has that impression changed, mellowed, hardened, clarified over the years? Uh, I turned 21 my first tour in Vietnam, and not a day goes by that I don't think about something, an individual, an incident. Uh, but uh, I'm proud of my service, proud of the uniform I wore. Uh, I, I don't have any bad recollections. I don't think about any political misgivings. I just thought that uh, I was a young man that made the right decisions, and I stand by those decisions of uh, volunteering for the Army, volunteering to go into flight school, and volunteering for both my tours in Vietnam. Okay. Bill, yeah. how about you? So my story is probably a little bit different. One, I was older. I was 25 when I got drafted, and I got drafted. I didn't volunteer. Uh, I had a student deferment up to that point, and they kind of I got married, and, and so my student deferment uh, went out the window because I couldn't stay in school and, and support a wife. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, so I was older, and, and and I think that gave me some advantages in terms of how I reacted or how I responded to the situation that I was in, because I had basically more time to do that. Now, as far as changes, um, we'll, talk, I'm sure we'll talk more later, but uh, when I went back this last year, um, I learned some things that changed, did change some of my perspective regarding what we were going, what we were trying to achieve in Vietnam. But uh, while, while I was there, um, I really focused on, on getting to know the Vietnamese people and, and trying to do what I could do to help them and I think I did a good job of that. Well, you know, since you mentioned uh, your recent return, uh, Milt has just returned from uh, a trip to Vietnam uh, this year. Right. Right. First time? First time back, yes. Okay. It might be, uh, might be appropriate at this point. Uh, let's, let's look at some of those slides that uh, you took. Okay. Um, and we're not going to show all of them because there's some, <laughs> several hundred of them. But we, we picked a few out. And uh, Milt, why don't you walk us through, this is, of course, a visit to Vietnam in 2017, just this year. Yes. Tell us, let's go to the next slide and uh, orient us to where we are here, Milt. Where'd you okay. fly into? Uh, and, we... Uh, it's interesting. We flew into what the, what's known today on a, officially as Ho Chi Minh City, although uh, three quarters of the Vietnamese in South Vietnam have gone back to calling it Saigon. Uh, okay. We spent uh, some time touring there, and then we went out to Tay Ninh, which is the, 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 the dot to the left of Ho Chi Minh. We're way down on the bottom of the map uh, where the Coochie tunnels were and, and some other ones. From there, we flew up to Quy Nhan and then got on some buses and then started driving north. And our first stop relative to my tour was in a, a fishing village called Sawin. And we were on a peninsula across an inlet from Sawin uh, in an LZ called Charlie Brown. Uh, 
Now that's via, that's Saigon. This is out of Saigon. Wow. This is this is the uh, Continental Hotel that, or Caravel Hotel, which was a famous uh, landmark in the sense is that's where most of the press stayed during Vietnam in Saigon. Uh, the country is built up tremendously, so you know, what you see there. They have a museum to the war, and it's filled with uh, relics of everything that, that got left behind. And so this was an aircraft. Inside behind me is where the museum is, and it's, it's filled with, and then we were warned in advance, but filled with a lot of, of basically uh, communist propaganda about the war and who we were, et cetera. So um, a lot of it, you, you, you knew their perspective when you went in to see mm -hmm. all the signs. And that's, that of course, an there. American uh, period yeah, uh, this is American. attack aircraft. Yes, F5, F the Tiger. Yeah. This is the Presidential Palace. It's been restored. Actually, I don't think it was destroyed much. Uh, very beautiful place. Uh, and uh, you saw that to some extent in the Ken Burns series. Uh, it's, uh, like I say, it's, it's, it's a very interesting. This is where all the official meetings mm -hmm. during the Vietnam era happened with the, yeah. the very presidents and the vice presidents. And they've got, actually, they got meeting rooms where the presidents meet and meeting rooms where the vice presidents meet. And mm -hmm. uh, this is a combination. This is the photograph of the CIA mm -hmm. building uh, with everybody climb, trying to climb on the helicopters. And then above it is the actual building. Now, at that time, you can see there was nothing behind it. Today, there's a 25 or 30 story hotel. A um, lot of construction. I think the overall population of Saigon, at, and, and when we were there, was somewhere between three and four million. The estimation today is that there are about 13 million people that live in Saigon. So, uh, uh, among other things, there's a lot of different people. This is a typical army ceremony that we have, a uh, military ceremony, the, the missing soldier. And it's a tribute to the, the, our POWs or MIAs that, that we have, and it's how we remember them in the military. And there's mm -hmm. there's the uh, symbology of all the various elements that are on the table. It's a part of a recitation that we do, and, and to honor the the POWs and MIAs that we have. Uh, now, were the local left. officials uh, in? I take it this is in Saigon. Yeah, so this were the in local Saigon. officials there? The communist officials were they sympathetic or at least? Uh, uh, accepting of of you guys and and and, and ceremonial uh, things like this. Yeah, they, they were. I um, again, we were t you were talking about the historical toning down. There's probably been more toning down in Vietnam than there has been in in, in America because they're uh, especially in the South. Uh, the Vietnamese love Americans, and, and so you could go anywhere, and you know it was you were well accepted. This is a remnant of the French. Uh, this is called the Notre Dame Cathedral, and this is an active uh, Catholic church. Uh, they have mass six to eight times a week. Uh, a lot of participants, and, and but it's a it's a essentially it's a remnant of the of the French colonial period, as it was built during that French colonial period. So, are you allowed to carry on your faith, whether it's Catholic or Buddhist or? They, uh, I didn't see any any indications of uh, religious repression at all during a period of time. Um, this particular church here looks brand new, you can tell. Uh, Tin Lan is the Vietnamese uh, umbrella for Protestant. It probably is a combination of four or five of our U.S. denominations. Uh, but everywhere that we went, we saw a lot of these churches. Uh, we stopped one Sunday evening and we saw a very active congregation. And this is a unique Vietnamese religion called Cao Dai, uh, formed in the mid-1920s. Uh, their overriding philosophy is they believe in all religions, there's some good, and so they're an amalgamation of everything and anything that you can think of. Do, Organ those, do those robes that they're wearing, are those ceremonial robes, or is that just their dress? Uh, they actually indicate a um, uh, position within the church structure. They're organized very much like the Roman Catholic Church, where they have uh, bishops and cardinals and all that. So, uh, During Vietnam, they also had a very large army, and so they were fighting on the side of the, of the, of the Americans, too. So oh, okay. that uh, was another, another factor. What are we looking at there? It looks like a hole in the ground. <laughs> well, it kind of is. That's, a, that's an air, air vent to one of the tunnels. At this time, you're standing on top of one of the tunnels in, in the famous Where are we at Kuchi now tunnels. on the map? Uh, Tain Inn, nearby Tain Inn, this is Kuchi. And we didn't realize this structure was there. And, Inland from Saigon. Oh yeah, it's almost into the almost to the Cambodian border, so you'll see that. And this is what it looks like down inside one of those tunnels. How they did that with virtually no mechanical. I mean, it was all dug by hand, and this is hard. It's almost like cement. So it's like this is an example. This was a uh, there. They have we have nor people who were in the North Vietnamese Army. They're guiding it. 
Uh, one of the famous things that you hear is they talk about spider holes as they pop up. Okay, there's a series here where basically this guy is standing there in the hole with, with the cover of the hole, hole. You see him go down and then you see there he's going down. And then the next one you'll see what it looks like after he disappeared. Now, if you were walking along on the trail, you wouldn't realize that there was anything there whatsoever. And in fact, you could step on the lid to that and you wouldn't know that it was there. At the same time, uh, he could pop up. So Where are we here? Okay, now we're in Sawan, and the little white dot kind of in the middle there is uh, where our LZ uh, Charlie Brown would have been. Are we on the coast now? This is on the coast. Uh, if you followed the water to the right, you'd be out in, uh, well, the X actually show, talks about what they were. We called it the China Sea or South China Sea. The Vietnamese and the Chinese don't get along really all that well. And so in Vietnam, it's called, now called the Vietnam Sea. Uh, there's... Now this is probably something where Tom would know, uh, remember, but anyhow, this is, the, this is what the airfield at Duck Phu looks like today. Uh, it's kind of like a park, but... Uh, yeah. Now we're moving up the coast now. We're moving up the coast. Let's we're go back north. to that map and uh, uh, take a look once again, Reorient. Where, where are we now on okay, the map? Okay, no. uh, Duck Phu, if you see kind of about the, the three-quarter mark up there, there's the big star that says Quignon. Duck Phu is the, is the star right below that. Okay. And this was the Duckfo was the headquarters of the 11th Light Infantry Brigade, which is one of the three brigades that comprised the Americal Division. Were you so, now in your travels? How did you get from star to star, uh, from point um, to point? I presume these are more or less military. Uh, the stars represent well, they just, where we stopped. Or points star, of yeah. military interest. Yeah, yeah. Military interest, whatever we had. Um, did, you, did they have but, uh, you know we had little, commuter airlines out there? Or? We, no, actually, Vietnam, Viet, Vietnam Air is a very modern air, airline. In fact, it's a it's a Delta associate, uh, and very the the service on board is you know was was very good. I mean, it's better than some of our service, but uh, you know it was it was it was quite good. Uh, very courteous, very thoughtful, okay. uh, all that. Uh, but as we once we were on land, we were in about twenty five passenger buses because uh, I don't know if we'll see it in here, but some of the roads were such that. Uh, the big 44, 45 passenger buses would never have made the corner. Uh, this is uh, what basically a part of what Milai looks like today. Uh, kind of to the halfway left on the left side there was a remnant of what one of the houses would have been. Mm -hmm. To the right is a museum that they have for, mm -hmm. for, the, for the Milai incident. Okay, next slide please. Uh, this again and probably some, this is uh, one of the few remnants of our, when we were there, these are revetments where they parked aircraft at uh, Chulai. Uh, so we're there. Chulai is a is a is an airport today, and they fly act active. Yeah. Uh, Cute little face. Yeah. Everywhere we went. Again, this is like an American. Everywhere we went, the people, the the mother that's standing behind her there, they brought their kids out to to, to see us, uh, and we had people along with us that had chocolate bars and all like. So we'd give them their chocolate. You probably look close at her mouth. You see the chocolate stains there. Uh, after 1976, the Russians came in, and one of the things they did for Vietnam is they built some 256 hydroelectric dams so that uh, Vietnam does not have a shortage of water. Uh, but now they don't have a shortage of electricity either because electricity is, is everywhere in the country. Uh, there's no place that has. Uh, also with that comes the fact that everybody's got a satellite dish. Mm -hmm. Every house that we went by almost had a satellite dish off. So they're they're very... They're very modern. Cell phone towers, everything just uh, all over the place. We're looking at a menu, I guess. Huh? Yeah. This is a drink menu, just as a matter. Uh, the Vietnamese exchange rate was 22,000 to one. And so that very bottom there with a duzem, anyhow, at 25,000, meant that uh, the beer was, is roughly a buck and a dollar and 10 cents for a 12 ounce <laughs> can of beer. What is that? Uh, this was a famous Vietnamese beer. When we were in Vietnam, it was known as 33 or Bobby Ba. Yeah. Um, you can tell you're in the communist country because you get these things all over the countryside, and and I don't know how many people pay to it. Our guides told us that about only five percent of the population today are actual communists, ninety-five percent are not. Uh, they 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 opened up in, in eighty-six. They began to transition, and more so in ninety-three. Uh, entrepreneurial. Everywhere you went, there were people selling everything they could, and this was kind of like the same as we had when we were in Vietnam. Everywhere you went, somebody was trying to sell you something. And then this is kind of reminiscent of when we were in Vietnam. This is a favorite sort of transfer. The stick they, they we use, call them jogi sticks, but they can carry a lot 
of weight on those. And, and it, somewhere, if you, I think in the Ken Burns, if you watch the, the shuffling, it kind of dictates their gait because they can't bounce too much. They kind of have to walk real, uh, real, real steady. They sound like capitalists. Yeah, they're, it, it's growing. They have a, a very rapidly expanding middle class. Uh, and I'm sure the government officials won't tell you that, but you talk to the private citizens there uh, who wear it. They estimate that communism maybe is going to be, it'll be a communist government country for maybe 10 years at the max because the middle class is going to be so large that uh, yeah. it, 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 Well, don't they have a to... term called, uh, I believe it's doimoi, which is yeah. a term for a kind of, it's, it's their way of rationalizing entrepreneurialism or capitalism yeah. um, in a communist country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is this was a unique. Uh, not a lot of people see this, but these are silkworms, and they, the top one are the silkworms are like five days old, and the middle one are ten days old, and the bottom one are fifteen mm -hmm. days old. So this was uh, this was in Hoi An, and then when they spin their cocoons, this is this is what a silk cocoon looks like. Uh, they kill whatever's inside of it because they boil it, and then they they unstring the cocoon, and that becomes the basis for silk. And they at that particular place, if you. If you're interested, you can send this particular company a photograph, and they will actually embroider you a silk version of that photograph. They, they are amazing in terms mm -hmm. of their quality, but they, that's how they do that. This, now we're in Da Nang. Um, uh, again, this is the Catholic Church. We, there's a nun that runs an orphanage. It's really a combination of orphanage, daycare center. Um, I took that because, again, uh, you know, here we are in the heart of Da Nang in an orphanage, and what do you have on the wall but a, a seven, you know, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Well, Disneyland is everywhere. Disney. <laughs> yeah, Disney's everywhere, and, and, you, and, you, and you see that. So, uh, you know, they're uh, some of them are orphans, some are the daycare, some of them have single parents, and so the, 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 the child is there for the day. Uh, but do you find they, an inordinate amount of orphanages and orphans in country there in Vietnam? This is the only one we visited. There may be more, but that was the only one we visited. But uh, one of the things the kids did was they, they impressed us with their English. Was, they were all Lincoln English, so they would, they would count from one to whatever, and they would say the days of the week and the months of the year mm -hmm. and, and all the rest. So they were learning English. So it sounds so like very disposed to Americans. They are, they are. Uh, most of the time when we would stop at a village, uh, the kids in particular would be the first ones coming out to see us, and they were always trying out their English on us, so mm -hmm. they, uh, they, always wanted, they, always, they always wanted to talk English. Mm -hmm. And then this is a typical kid's school uniform, is the white shirt, the red tie, the blue. And throughout so the a, country? Throughout the country. Mm -hmm. It probably is north and south, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, that's how you tell the, the, that's the elementary school. Sure, and this, yeah. the picture there, he was shot on, on, on China Beach, which is, which is a regular film. And again, the, the day they call it, the Vietnamese call it Vietnam Beach. But, and then this is basically a picture of me on the same beach. Uh, probably the trees and stuff would have been a little behind me, but uh, uh, this, okay. this, is kind of, this is kind of the end of it. Okay, how we fitting. We'll, have, we'll end it there with a, a shot of you, and that's just this year. Yes. On China Beach. Yeah. Okay. Well, it, it certainly sounds like from looking at those that things have changed, at least for the Vietnamese, Yes. in terms of their sense of what the war was about. And it seems like, they put it behind them. To a lot of extent. The, the, the people that, most of the people, because it's 50 years ago, vast majority of the people that we met weren't born when Vietnam was taking place. They were born after the war. So they don't really know anything of the war first hand. And so they only know what their parents may have told them. And so that, and, and that's, that's, that is one of the factors in there. Um, the country itself went through three phases from 76 to 86. They tried to make it a communist country. Uh, so many people were fleeing the country that they decided that wasn't going to work. And I think from the Ken Burns, it also talked about 86 was when uh, Le Xuan died up in Hanoi. And so he was more of the hardliner. And so they eased off a lot. They changed a lot of their policies in 86. And then they made even a more change in 93 when Clinton normalized relations. Yeah. So there's some phases to where now and so from 93 to today is another 15 years. And so they're they're Clinton definitely was, going toward, yeah. toward the... the, the, the um, entrepreneurial, uh, capitalist approach. Well, I'm more concerned about what's changed for you guys. Uh, obviously, Milt, you've, you went back this year, and uh, I guess your comment is that that trip, to some extent, changed or softened your approach to the, to the, whole, to the war itself. Um, Tom, what's, uh, 
What's your assessment at this point of your experience in Vietnam? Uh, it was an experience. Um, I'm older now. Uh, I wouldn't do the same things I did in a helicopter. I think combat's for young people. Um, and uh, I, I, it was a, a life-defining moment for me because um, of all I saw, all I did, and I think it, to a great degree, made me a better person because I was able to experience something. And um, I, I feel that um, uh, I, I served well. Uh, it was a great moment in my life. And like I said earlier, there's probably not a day goes by that I don't think of something. Something reminds me of something. Uh, but uh, having said that, another thing that uh, Milt and I have in common is we both got into the National Guard and the Reserves and we came back. So we were able to continue our military service to a great degree, and that might have dissipated any anxieties or concerns because we were amongst soldiers, part-time yeah. citizen soldiers, but it was a, um, uh, it, it was a way of uh, being amongst a lot of other Vietnam veterans that were then coming into the um, uh, Guard and Reserve early on. Uh -huh. uh, when, I, when I was that my first National Guard unit, there are more Vietnam veterans in my National Guard unit than there was in the VFW or America Legion in the city I was in. Okay. Were, were either of you, so to some extent, you were insulated or otherwise distracted from the general sense of the population that... Uh, Might have been. I, I was going to school. That it was a terrible war. Yeah. We had done I, a, I went back to college the, and I had no problems in college. Uh, no issues, no uh, confrontations, and uh, I think that probably was, uh, if there was any healing, that might have been it, because if, I, if there were incidents or issues, I might have had to reflect a little bit differently, but I was uh, Tom Lasser, American, out of the Army, uh, back home. And life was good again? Life was good. I was, uh, um, I, I, life was good, and I, I, I was very fortunate uh, I was wounded twice, but very minor wounds. I didn't get crippled, so I, I, I don't have that torment to, uh, you know, to think about either. Yeah. But as you said, not a day goes by that you don't think about I, that experience. I think about this. I see a helicopter, uh, the, the Ken Burns movie, uh, something in the newspaper, something on the news. I just read recently that uh, 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 Vietnam is becoming a strong military ally because of their concerns about how China's pushing into the South China Sea, the Vietnam Sea as they call it. Uh, so who would have thought 40, 50 years ago that turn of events where we'd be providing military support, they're buying equipment from us, uh, we're having advisors over there. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a totally different scene. Did you see much military operations while you were there? Any? We, saw, we visited some sites where they had some. We saw some um, locations where they trained, but you did you saw some military, but not an extensive presence. I, you know, it's kind of like you'd see them on their motorcycle going to work in the morning. Out of and, sight, and, out of mind, because yeah, they're going to the base. Yeah, and so that, and but uh, uh, if you call it a presence, it was extremely minor. Yeah. Well, you mentioned the Ken Burns documentary. We've mentioned it earlier today. It's, it's on everybody's, a lot of people's minds. We've just, uh, you know, seen it on television. Uh, some of us, uh, all 10 episodes. Uh... 15 hours of, of the Vietnam legacy. What do you think he missed? I, I, one part I, I saw that he didn't acknowledge the ARVN, the Army of Vietnam, South the Vietnamese Vietnam. Sol South Vietnamese soldiers, who played an extraordinary part of, uh, of uh, the defense of their country. Milton and I got to go home. Our, our counterpart, stayed there and there and, and fought until the war was over. Uh, but uh, they, they had their ups and downs, and um, they had some poor leaders, but they had some good leaders. At the Battle of Way, a lot of people don't realize uh, in the current book um, uh, uh, that's out that uh, the Vietnamese held part of the town, more of the town than the Marines did uh, at the beginning of it, and they fought well. Uh, the South Vietnamese. The South Vietnamese fought well when, when supplied with, and with added equipment they fought very well, and they were they were they were good soldiers. Do you think that we supported them in the manner in which, at the level at which they should have been supported, given their technology, given their understanding of warfare at the time? Not initially. We were 
probably treating them as second class citizens. You know, the American Army was there and the Air Force and the Marines and uh, they were, they were, we gave them World War II equipment and M1 rifles, but it was the latter part of 68, I think, when the Vietnamization yeah. program started, uh, they started getting M16s, uh, newer helicopters, and at that point, they, 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 were, they were transitioning into a pretty modern uh, uh, fighting force. All along, good soldiers. And um, you saw at the end when, uh, in 75, when uh, we as Americans uh, uh, stopped supplying them, they, they crumbled because uh, they, they couldn't uh, get ammunition or fuel yeah. and uh, the North Vietnamese took over. Bill, is that your impression of the South Vietnamese Army, the Arvin? Yeah, I, you know, my experience with them too, because as during the Vietnamese area, we would go on joint operations. Our our battalion would go on an operation with an Arvin, and and they were very, they were very effective. I didn't I didn't see that. Now again, uh, you know, Ken Burns talks about some of the corruption, and that existed. And I don't know that. I mean, we were we were probably as much responsible for that because they at, when when I was there, the the average income for a Vietnamese was thirty dollars a year. And we were coming in with, you know, making 50, 100 times that. And so we had so much more money to spend. And so, you know, we could do things they didn't do. The Vietnamese particularly weren't necessarily dumb because it was, it, it was like if the American wants to fight this war for us, then, you know, have at it. You know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's like well, I'm not going to get I'm not going to stand in their way. Uh, but, in, you know, and I think that piece of it we brought on ourselves. So the inverse of what you're, what you're actually saying is that we sort of disenabled them by, with our presence and we did not allow them to take over command of operations and so forth. So, they were, so when we left them on their own, they fell apart. Well, I th the, the, the falling apart piece, I think, was more from, from the logistical support. They just didn't, they didn't have the, the like they're talking about, they didn't have the bullets. They didn't have, the, they didn't have what they needed to prosecute the war. And then the other piece of it is, is the, the North Vietnamese brought in a lot of, lot of tanks, armor. And, and uh, uh, if, you, if you're not prepared to defend against armor, uh, and that takes a special thing like that, uh, it's, it'll do just what they did. It'll just run right over you because yeah. they'll... Do you think that if we... We pulled out 73, yeah. uh, all of our troops, as I mentioned earlier. But if we had kept supplying them and even, and even defended them from the air, uh, we, I mean, we pulled back air support as well at some point. Do you think that the will of the South Vietnamese was such that they could have sustained? I don't think the outcome of the war at some point in time would have been any different than it, than it was. Um, Primarily, the, the, it was the motivation. The North Vietnamese, their objective was to unify the country, and that was their goal. The South Vietnamese were, to some extent, defending their freedoms, but th that, was, that was a little more nebulous. And the other piece is that the, the, the North Vietnamese were willing to sacrifice whatever it took to do it. In other words, they, 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 would, they would spend whatever manpower. They would, they would get as many people of their from their side killed as, as necessary to accomplish their goal. They, they, they didn't hold back on it. Or the South Vietnamese, uh, the challenge you have, and, and I think that's true in almost any war, is the South were more agrarian. They're, they, were, they were the farmers. And mm -hmm. the, at the farmer level, they weren't really that political. I, you know, I think at one point in time, I had a set of briefing, they were talking about the fact is that there was uh, somewhere over 200 different political parties in South Vietnam. So you know, it was kind of like everybody had, everybody had their view. Yeah, but uh, but there were there were socioeconomic differences between the people in the south and the people in the north. Oh, Could you say so. that? Yeah, quite so, quite so. The 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 the, the north I think was much more military oriented. Uh, you, if you didn't agree with the government, you were probably going to get killed. I mean, you know, they were they were the government itself was much more oppressive. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that was one of the things that Ken Burns didn't talk about was a, a program that we ran, it was, and we used to use leaflets to do that, and it was called Chu Hoi, mm -hmm. which was uh, basically persuading the North Vietnamese to come, you know, desert and come on over our side. And it was actually quite effective. And then the other one, which was, was hazardous to their health, ultimately, was uh, some of these people came, became what, they, what we call Kit Carson Scouts. And so when we would go out with an, an operation, 
we would have a, a Vietnamese interpreter with us, and then we'd have one of these Kit Carson scouts who knew NVA tactics to, to come along and advise us on what we were probably seeing, because you know, to some extent we didn't know. Well, obviously those guys, when the South folded, were extremely at risk because you know not only were they deserters from the North Vietnamese Army, but they were they were they aided they aided the other side on top of it. Of course, you know everybody talks about this, the turning point, the turning point of the Vietnam War being this Tet Offensive, which was really basically three offensive efforts on the part of the North Vietnamese and the NVA and the Viet Cong to find pressure points, of, to, to break the back of South Vietnam, Vietnam in, in several different areas and, and, and uh, in several different ways. Did it? Did it? Um, militarily, we won the battle. We defeated their efforts, but politically, we lost it because uh, our leadership was saying, uh, we saw it, we, there's, that term came up in the late 67, saying uh, we see the light at the end of the tunnel, uh, just a little bit more here, and we're going to be doing okay. Boom, Tet came along, which wasn't that complete a surprise. I just finished reading uh, uh, the, uh, the, the current book, uh, Tet 68, which is pretty good. And a lot of people saw what was going on, but they couldn't connect the dots. And the night before Tet, the Arvin, the South Vietnamese military, said something's coming up, so they canceled leave for all their soldiers. But the soldiers were still coming back to their uh, forts and uh, bases uh, when it started. But the, 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 um, the North Vietnamese was anticipating a, a mass a revolution, a people's uprising. And like Milt said, <laughs> I'm going to grow my rice and have my family. I'm out of this. So there was no popular uprising, and the military was able to uh, uh, win all the battles and, and stop what they were doing now. Um, everybody thought that there was a big fight in Saigon, but uh, the, the center of gravity to, to a great deal was the Battle of Wei, which went on for about three and a half weeks, as it turned out. But uh, the... Um, yeah, there's a gentleman that wrote a book recently about it. Yeah, that. I just read it. Uh, it's here someplace. And I just happened to have a copy yeah, of it. Yeah, so how about that? <laughs> Shall we show that? Yeah. Shall we show that book? Where is it? There's a book down below here. Yeah. There. The Mark Bowden book, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Same guy that wrote uh, Black Hawk Down. Yeah, so you're saying that, that this, is that what you're saying, that Huey was really a, a larger um, field of operation than even the Saigon uh, battles it, it, during the It was Tennessee? because it, 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 when they took the city, they took the area around it and they, they cordoned it off so the relief forces couldn't come in. But like Mark Bowden says, it was a turning port of the American War in Vietnam. And uh, to a great degree it was, even though we won the battles and we took over the provincial capitals and chased them all out, uh, we lost the political effort uh, because of the uh, trauma that people saw on TV uh, thinking, oh, where's the end of the tunnel? This isn't the end of the tunnel. And that changed. Uh, Lyndon Johnson and, and a couple months later said he wasn't going to run for re-election yeah. because uh, his presidency was doomed after his optimism was turned out to be... Uh, not so. Yeah. Well, and increasingly, I mean, you guys can talk about this better than I can, but increasingly, you guys were, it seemed like you were limited somewhat. You had your fire bases, especially up in the north. You had your fire bases, you had your occupied hillsides. We, we saw a picture of earlier of mm. some of those scenes. You would occupy the high ground and, and, and the bases and surround the bases and, and just wait, I guess, wait to be attacked. Yeah, I don't know. That, that was that I, the strategy? I don't know. That we wait to be attacked per, per se. I mean, we patrolled off of them, so it's like we had a fire base. Uh, the one that I spent the most time on was called LZ San Juan Hill. That was in inland, mm -hmm. and it was a battalion base. So we would have one company providing perimeter security. We had an artillery battery, uh, 105s on the base with us to provide artillery support, and then we had four other companies that were down, and they were always out patrolling, and so they were, you know, doing whatever they could, and, and you know. I guess it's one of those things. You were always you were on patrol. You never knew when you were going to run into the enemy. Uh, sometimes it was on their terms. Sometimes it wasn't. Uh, sometimes we actually surprised them. But uh, so you know, if you watch the Ken Burns documentary, you don't get that, that impression. You get the impression that we waited to be attacked and then we responded to the attack. Is that really not the right impression? 
I don't think so. We uh, we were always out aggressively patrolling. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, as a platoon leader, I mean, I would take my platoon and we would go, like I talked about that one hill. I mean, I don't know how many times we walked around that hill just basically patrolling, and we would find different things at different times. Uh, you know, it was just, it was that some of them, uh, you know, that's part of, in retrospect, you know, you're talking about you doing what you do. In retrospect, I think back to the situation I encountered there, and it was kind of like, what was I thinking? Because um, when you went out on the countryside, if if the we were encountering primarily NVA, there was a few VC, but if they weren't around, everybody was in their cities, you know, in their villages. They were doing the thing. They were harvesting, right? Whatever they was that they do, they were there. A lot of times, it was a group of old ladies sitting there, chatting, whatever like that. But then, the part that that you know never really thought about was when you went out on a patrol and you didn't see anybody because that meant that the MVA were somewhere out there. And so, you know, the enemy, when we're talking about combat, the enemy was always right there and you never knew. And so, I mean. Well, that's what they supposedly learned from the Tet Offensive and that was perhaps the purpose of the Tet Offensive in 68 was to figure out how to fight Americans. And one of the things that they came back with was uh, the North Vietnamese, the NVA, as I understand it, was the philosophy of go out and grab them by the belt. And that's how they learned to fight, was to attack you full force, get inside, so you would not have air support. Mm -hmm. So the massive United States Air Force could not respond. That actually started at the, in the Ayod Ring. That was the major uh, uh, teaching point to the North Vietnamese in November of 1965, was grab them by the pistol belt, keep them close, so that you can't, a fire in between them or you're, you're going to hit friendlies, uh, as it turned out, uh, which was a pretty smart tactic, and they were pretty good at it. Uh, so yeah. our tactic, as aggressive as the American infantryman was, and a lot of our leaders were, they would try to disengage, and it made it look like they were retreating, but they were just trying to get some space in between mm -hmm. so the Air Force could come in. And artillery. Uh, and artillery or whatever they were, they were using. Yeah. But uh, a lot of aggressive patrolling, like Milt was saying, a lot of um, uh, uh, sweeps. Uh, uh, what was the, the term um, uh, they used to use uh, for uh, large sweeps? Um, I, I can't think about the search and destroy. Search and destroy, straight. search and destroy. That was an aggressive combat operation. You were searching for the bad guys and hopefully destroying them. Now, the Viet Cong, more so than the, the North Vietnamese, were pretty elusive. This was their backyard. They were small. They were light, uh, light infantry. They could move very fast. They uh, wore they could, black pajamas. Yeah. Uh, you, you didn't know when they were there. Now, I had a whole different perspective than Milk, because I flew helicopters. So I was looking as a, as a big sightseer for, uh, in the sky. Um, and having said that, uh, flying a helicopter, uh, there were a lot of milk runs. I, I'd go days without ever hearing anybody getting shot or getting shot at myself. Days, because you were flying a milk run. You're flying, this was a cold LZ, and you were picking up guys over here, putting them over there, and this was happening, and you did this. Mm -hmm. but every once in a while, the poop would hit the propeller, and oh boy, you didn't want to be there. You didn't want to be around, and you were trying to figure out a way to get out of there. But I had infantrymen say, you know, we really, uh, we really worried about you guys because uh, you, you couldn't go anyplace. You know, you're up there flying and bullets are flying and there you are, you're so vulnerable. And I'm thinking to myself, geez, I can get the heck out of there. But you are stuck in a hole and you got to stay there as, I get, as I'm moving out. Um, and I think this is an 8th Air Force uh, comment about combat is 98% boredom and 2% sheer terror. And there's probably a lot to yeah. that. And you, and you find out how scared you can get uh, real, real doggone quick, like. And I remember the thing, say, thinking to myself, "What am I doing here? What? Mm -hmm. What am I doing here? <laughs> Isn't this over yet?" But it didn't happen that often. To some people, it did. This is I'm just talk, talking about my experience. But I think the average Army helicopter pilot, Marine Corps helicopter, would tell you there was just a lot of ash. And, we used to call it ash and trash, yeah. uh, milk runs, and um, it, you know, interrupted every once in a while by some pretty nasty uh, stuff lying around. But those medals that you have and those purple hearts that you have belay that a little bit and tell us of a little bit different story uh, that where you were in harm's way enough times to be... Uh, yeah, but you know, I spent two tours, two 12-month flying tours there, and, um, and, and uh, that was minor compared to some of the stuff that was going on. I got a couple medals. 
for things I, I didn't think I deserved. And there was a couple of times I did something that I thought I did something extraordinary and I wasn't considered for it. Having said that, that's just the way it goes uh, as it turned out. Uh, my first Purple Heart when I was 21, just turned 21, um, there was more urine in my flight suit than blood on me because it, it startled the bejeebers out of me that, uh oh, you know, there's stuff flying around the cockpit here and I'm in the wrong place. The, uh, I, I was lucky that I wasn't harmed were and traumatized from it. Uh, I look back on some experiences, some scary stuff, but I look back on some of the fun times, some of the, the guys I met, some of the things we did, some of the laughs we had. Um, uh, th those moments fog over some of the other scary parts that I participated in, and maybe Milt had some of that. But uh, my experience with helicopter pilot was different. I could go home to a bunk with a sheet, maybe get a cold beer, mm -hmm. and I could pulled a sheet over me and a blanket and I was in a warm bed where he's in a hole yeah. where it's raining on him and well, you know, he we, can't hide. We, Milt had his Kodak moment. <laughs> let's, give, <laughs> let's give you one. Uh -oh. you, uh, Tom has uh, brought along a few photographs. Maybe you could walk us through this like Milt did. Uh, okay. Tom, what are, what, are we lo what are we looking at here? Well, first of all, everybody in Vietnam went to the PX and bought a camera. Now, we were instructed when you were flying you could not have an operated camera in the cockpit because it was distracting. You know, you, you're supposed to be at the controls, monitoring the radios, or observing everything like that. This particular one's from my second tour. This is uh, the summer of uh, 1970, and this is the flight line at Chu Lai West. Uh, those are CH-47s parked there. Now, I where think, is Chu Lai? Uh, Chu Lai is in, uh, south of Da Nang, about 50, 60 miles south of Da Nang. Mm -hmm. and in the right, I-Core zone? In the I-Core zone. Uh, it, actually, it was in between where uh, Milt was uh, at uh, Duck Fo, and, uh, and Da Nang, but it was, uh, uh, the, the Marines had gone in there and uh, we had uh, taken over part of their airfield uh, with Chinooks, and I think that photo is taken from the back porch of our mess hall. Okay, how about, how about this one? What's this? Uh, this has been my first tour. This was probably spring of 1967, and I'm receiving my first air medal. When I say by receiving my basic air medal, uh, you got an air medal for every 50 hours or 50 missions, whatever came, and you got a basic air medal and you got Oakley clusters for repeated awards. If you, if you got the basic medal every time, you'd look like a, a, a Panamanian field marshal. So they, they put a little number on the award, and I had 35 of those things after, uh, after two tours. How many missions did you fly? I accumulated 1,751 combat flying hours, which is right about a little over 1,000 missions over my two tours. Is this your office? This is my office. This is uh, the Boeing CH-47. Um, I'm on the left, uh, twin-engine cargo helicopter, still flying today. Uh, the Army's put the, the Huey away, but the, the modern Chinook uh, is an extraordinary aircraft. I loved it. Um, but this is the office. And uh, you know what every single one of those dials... You were, it was drilled into you. When you went home, um, sometimes you didn't have a beer, you, 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 you critiqued your flight. Uh, but when you go through an aircraft transition, a lot of it was memorizing uh, limitations, uh, air speeds, uh, different values for uh, flight characteristics and stuff like that. And you were tested on it. Even in Vietnam, you had to take a flight check to mm -hmm. make sure that you knew what you were doing. Yeah. So, um, this bring back a few memories? Yeah, that was uh, my aircraft, uh, second tour. Uh, now, I didn't name it. The flight engineer named it. Uh, but now, that's it, a Chinook. That's a CH-47. That's looking at the, um, uh, the starboard uh, side of the aircraft. Uh, the co-pilot sitting on the, uh, the right side and the aircraft yeah. commander on the other side. Yeah. And, and each aircraft, it was called Nose Art which goes back to World War II, each aircraft uh, was named something. And usually the enlisted guys named the aircraft, and mm -hmm. uh, you just kind of went along with it. Yeah. Is Foxy Lady a personal uh, uh, friend of yours? No comment. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, fill us in. Uh, the this is, on this um, I want to say March of 1969. This is an aerial shot of My Lai. Um, Flying Chinooks again. We flew in the investigators for uh, over a couple of weeks. We'd fly them in at 8 o'clock with security. We'd bring them out at 5 o'clock. And they, they probably did this for about two weeks. Uh, uh, there was a general, Piers, uh, who led the investigation, 20 investigators, and we put, it, put a couple of platoons of infantry around them. But uh, that was a pretty nasty country. My first tour in 67, um, the, uh, the um, uh, 
Korean Marines had a whole brigade that secured that area. Uh, Ho Chi Minh was actually born up the road from Eli. So there were some pretty hardcore characters in there, which doesn't make an excuse for some scared Americans, you know, to start shooting up a, a village. But uh, uh, that wasn't necessarily a, a peaceful place. Yeah. Okay. And finally... That's just uh, smiling Tom, uh, approaching his aircraft, uh, getting ready for a, a, a pre-flight briefing and a mission. That's, uh, again, on the starboard side. That's the uh, that's, that's you? That's me. That's, that's me. a skinny guy. I'm, yeah, I was skinny and young then. And um, uh, But that's an M60 door gun. We had three of them, one on each side and one on the ramp uh, on the CH-47. There's two at a Huey, one on mm -hmm. uh, left and right, as it turns yeah. out. But uh, this is probably a morning shot going out to get the crew, pre-flight the aircraft, go over the briefing, do the run-ups, and, um, and uh, get moving out. Okay. So nobody can say I didn't give you guys a cameo. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, gentlemen, uh, let's rewind a little bit. Let's go back to August of 1969. Right. You're where? I'm on a uh, forward fire base called LZ San Juan Hill. Uh, we're probably the most inland fire base uh, within the 11th Brigade in the Marical Division. We're about 20 kilometers from the coast. Okay. You so. took a little, you just happened to have an 8 millimeter camera. Right. As, mm. just, as just about everybody else probably did too at the time. Um, you took a little video in country of your fire base and surrounding area. Yeah. And it might be helpful to roll that video if we could and just, uh, Milt, once again, Prevail on you to give us a little play-by-play uh, -play here. Yeah. We're going to apologize for the bounciness, but they, you know they, this wasn't a professional production. Uh, Tom can relate to that. I'm in a flying Huey, and they have a certain little vibration to them that they kind of bounce along. Uh, this was our particular fire base, as you can see. That's how they looked. Uh, today, that's all forested, but then it wasn't. And there's the artillery battery, and then the, we were on... They were on one of the one of the peaks, and then we were our the infantry was on the other peak, and uh, where I stayed was kind of like right behind that. And then this so that's pretty like, typical that your mm -hmm. uh, you know your drop zones, your 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 uh, living arrangements yeah. essentially was on top of a hill. Correct, correct. You, know, you always wanted to be. You never wanted to be anywhere where somebody could shoot down at you. Okay, then then this is where we were going after the. Uh, the 51 cal, and somewhere along in that frame there, and it's too fast to see, but uh, somebody took a shot at that at that uh, jet with a rocket. So there's a 51 caliber anti-aircraft gun that's it's, harassing you guys. Yeah, it's down there where they're dropping all the bombs. Yeah, yeah four Phantom. They ever hit so, it? Uh, not really. Uh, they had they, they they dug in what they called a donut hole, which was they. They dug a platform down low, and then they dug a ring even lower so that the, the gunners could uh, be all be protected. And uh, we captured the gun, and we probably uh, will show that. Uh, it had a few few nicks on it, but for the most part, it was completely intact. What completely is that operational. aircraft right there? F-4 Phantom. That's the F-4 Phantom. The other one that you're seeing is... Um, I think it's an OV-10. It was, the, it was their, we, they, their code name, we just knew them. Their code name was Helix. Now, that's done with a medium-range starlight scope. Uh, this is shooting off the edge of where I was. Those are the observation uh, airplanes. OV-10 the, Bronco. Oh, Broncos, yeah. I was going to say, I just knew them by their code names. Their, their radio call, call sign. sign was a Helix. What are they and doing? So, they're just doing a bright. I mean, that you can see the barbed wire. That was the edge of our perimeter, mm -hmm. uh, and they were dropping uh, bombs on that. One of them, you'll probably see the black smoke because I think they they dropped a, uh, some napalm. And this guy is just kind of standing or shooting around there, and I was. They, that, Do they just, ever get shot at? These guys. Oh yeah. In fact, is at the same time we we were joking about some NVA must have taken a pot shot at one of these guys. And it really pissed him off, and so he brought, he brought everything he could bring in on it, and they totally obliterated the gun, that gun. This one, we actually, by the time we got in there, we were able to capture it. I think that's the one that's got the napalm. You see the black smoke, and that's that's what napalm looks like after it uh, things. Now, I noticed in the Ken Burns movie, they uh, show the, oh, there's uh, the same gun. scene several times. This is what the this is what a 51 caliber looks like. That's the gun we now, captured. How did you finally manage to silence this gun? 
Well, we sent basically we sent two infantry companies, which is like what two hundred plus guys climbing up the hill to where this thing was. And uh, fortunately for us, it doesn't do a whole. It, it couldn't be aimed down as well as it could be aimed up, and so it wasn't a threat to the infantry like it was. By the time we got there. The, the bombing had killed about, uh, it had about a five-man crew. It had killed at least three of the five men and, and, and a couple of the other two that were left were wounded. So it, it, by the time we got there, it wasn't really manned all that much, too. Had this uh, 51 caliber Viet, uh, it was a North, North Vietnamese, Vietnamese Chinese. It was probably Chinese-made. Yeah. yeah, did it do some damage to you guys? This one, uh, it shot down, it shot down one, one Huey. It was on the original assault to go in there. Uh, I don't know why they did, but they, they flew right over the top of it and it shot the main rotor off of Huey. And so we lost on that, just from that thing, we lost 10 Americans. There was six, six of our guys and four crew. Uh, there was, was the combat assault, they were, they uh, came in and Tom was talking about being a smoke ship. We used to lay a ring of smoke around and then you'd land in it and you did that to camouflage so that people couldn't, people couldn't shoot from outside of it. And the, the gun shot down the smoke ship, and then they brought a CH-47 out to retrieve the smoke ship, and it shot the CH-47 down. Now, the CH-47 made it to our base and was able to land on our helipad, just barely. And it had, it's, it, it, it had three, it's somewhere along in there, I think a little bit later, there, there's a shot, too, that I shoot up the, up the sights. You can see the sight, the, the, the chain of ammo there. This is, I shot that just to give some kind of a feel of, 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 you know what that gunner was looking at when he was using it, which yeah. was, and they had a fairly good range too. I think they were uh, like a fifty, uh, like a Madus, but uh, yeah, those guys, you know, Tom tell you flying those things. That was scary because you were out there all by yourself, low and, and slow, low and slow, and all by yourself, and and uh, so you know every once in a while we would we would do that. One of the things I flew along because we have the command and control helicopter, and so. That was just as scary because uh, the job of the command and helicopter was to fly in and, and mark the mark the landing zone with a with a with a smoke grenade, and so you, again you were by yourself. You What's dived he in doing a spot there? And that, that's the smoke smoke ship. That's there. smoke. The other one was the other one was was artillery landing, and here we were, we were visited by the deputy MACV commander in our base, and so when he came in, he had all sorts of security flying with him. Uh, my battalion commander at the time had been a company commander under him when he was a lieutenant colonel, and so they were. They're all inspecting sharing, that yeah. fifty-one caliber gun. Yeah, they're all looking at that fifty-one cal. Like I said, it shot down uh, three, at least three helicopters, killed uh, out of American crew, killed ten, ten Americans responsible for American death. This was down now. This is just a different, different side of the story. This is down in the village of Bateau, and this is the Songbei River at that point, mm -hmm. and you know. So, and this again, as I'm kind of flying out, this just shows you what some of the hamlets look like. Uh, they were just clusters of clusters of houses, and almost everybody there uh, uh, grew rice. Now, this was this is one. Uh, one of the things that Ken Burns didn't talk about is the fact that today about 40% of the population are animistic. They're uh, the native. Uh, those two little girls are there are actually boys, and they're, they're they had been cursed by a witch doctor. That if if the bad evil spirits had find, find them as boys, that they would uh, kill them, and so their mother to protect them dressed them as girls. <laughs> this wasn't propaganda from the North Vietnamese. No, no, no. Did. This is real. This is real. This, this is, is religious really, thing. This is a religious thing, and we had several cases like that. We we had a boy one time that was very sick, and the only way we got him ultimately was the witch doctor gave up on him, and so we finally got him and were able to take him out to a hospital ship and and treat him with medicine and, and basically do what he needed to have done to him. But again, this is a thing, and then this is another thing we did. We supported the, the, the medical. The only medical capability this entire district had at its headquarters were these two nurses. And, and so we did, I brought teams of doctors in quite frequently, and we would, we would treat. At one point in time, I was treating somewhere between five and 700 Vietnamese a week with, uh, with me, for medical. And so inoculations. Like and inoculations. And... The, the seriously sick would would line up and, and uh, the doctors would see them and then the kids with the leech bites would come to me and I would have a, 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 a stick and, and paint their leech bites with mercuricone. This is the Dang airfield at that time. And that's a going home uh, jet. That's a going home jet. Actually, I was on my way to R&R, &R, but still the same. We were, we, were, we were headed home. Well, I, know, I noticed in the, the footage that it looks like you guys spent a lot of time doing, you know, 
humanitarian work out yes. in, the, in some of the uh, villages and so forth? Yeah, I did. Um, that was that was a piece I think that Ken Burns missed. Is that we did a lot of humanitarian. I did uh, there. We brought in the, uh, the the American breed of pigs, a pole in China, to, to that gave them more meat. Um, I was in the process of starting a rabbit farm, so that, you know, because th they didn't have a lot of meat, and so rabbits you know, get things that grow fast and 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 good. But the other thing that they do is, is, is they, Ken Burns just talking about the fact is we introduced the it's a Philippine the I was called IR8 rice. It increased the uh, the, the, the efforts uh, somewhere, I don't know, 20 to 40 percent uh, more rice for, the, for the, their work. One of the things that I had done, and, and I, had, as a kid, had read The Early American, so one of the things that I tried to do very specifically was not change how they did things, but give them the tools to become more productive. They plant rice the way they plant rice. Yeah. I just wanted to make it so that when the rice was ready to harvest, they got more rice for, for their efforts. Uh, the, the last thing we did finally was introduced, uh, they dug a big pond and we brought in again a Philippine, the tilapia, which a lot of people are familiar with today. They're very fast breeding, they're, they're a bottom feeder, uh, they live on algae and, and they're a very fast breeder. We had it in for six months and there was always already the fourth generation of fish. You're out there trying to, you're defending your perimeter, you're out in the villages trying to do humanitarian work. You're providing foodstuffs and and farming techniques, modern as modern as you could get mm -hmm. techniques. You're inoculating people, and then you come back to the base camps behind the perimeter, mm -hmm. and you find then in the night. This is a story that David Halberstam tells. You find that in the night. You come back the next day and you find that during the previous night all of the arms that were inoculated were hacked off by VC or North Vietnamese. In uh, David Halber Halberstam's book he says that was the day I realized we were not going to win this war. Did you ever notice that? I never had that specific. Did ever happen to you? I, ne I never had that specific. It we happened in a number the, of villages it, throughout it, the... Yeah, it could. I think the instance was they were very in the remote. It was way, it was kind of like over in the Cambodia, Cambodia Laotian been. border, you know, way the highlands, uh, you know, and really remote. We weren't, I would, we weren't necessarily that remote. So, I mean, we were inland significant distance, but we weren't. So you don't have any remote. incidences, I mean, like that, where you'd, yeah. could, you'd go in in the day and set something up for people, come back to your base camp, and, and at night the VC would move in or NVA would move in and un try and undo what you were doing. No, no. Our area, our area was was the, the, the Bato in particular, and then we had another one called Yavak. They were both pretty secure. The the, the, yeah. the Vietnamese had it under control, and it's largely due to the fact is is that we had uh, we had a Monyard tribe there they're called the Rays. It's H R E, and they were a very small tribe, maybe twenty five hundred members of the tribe, and so uh, we were taking care of them, and they were loyal to us, and and so uh, they didn't. Well, orient us to the part. We have a map here. Yeah. Okay. Um, orient us to the part of the country that you're talking. Wh where you were, if you can put your finger on the map okay. at the time. Okay. Uh, Duck Fo was. It was. We showed a thing like that, and then so we were coming. We would have been like about 30 kilometers, which I don't know how to convert to miles, but we were about 30 kilometers, almost due west of there in in a valley. And if I could see, if you could see that, if there was a river was valley. The Songbei River came through and it came out over here, but it was mm -hmm. like a, so it's basically right here was, was uh, where, where most of this was taking place. Okay. And the village of Milai is, is where? Milai is... Near Quang Nai, north, just north of Quang Nai. Yeah, where's Quang Nai? Oh, right here. Quang Nai is inland. Milai is uh, probably that little point right there. Could be. Mm -hmm. it's, it's in close, that area. It's, it's somewhere in that area. Yeah. It's north of Duck Fo and it's... Yeah. What year, probably, what year was that? Milai? Yeah. 1968. It was March of 68. March, March of 68. Yeah. yeah. Now, the the uh, the company, is which right here, Charlie First the 20th, I was part of it. I joined it in January of 69. That was the company that was in Milai. So, mm -hmm. Cali was a platoon leader in the company. Mm -hmm. He, I think he had first platoon. When I was there, I had four, third platoon. Yeah. So, Your division. But I knew. Mm -hmm. No, actually, the actual company. I mean, I had guys in I had guys in my company that were in my platoon 
that had been in Milai. Mm -hmm. So it's egregious and it's ugly, and you know nobody uh, supported anything, anything like that. Uh, and I'm uh, sure it might have happened a couple other times. Uh, this was the uh, the largest incident, and it was covered by the media quite a bit, and um, it was investigated thoroughly, and uh, leadership was adjudicated. Uh, like a lot of other things, the higher-ranking guys got off, and they went after Lieutenant Cowley, uh, who was the trigger puller, uh, rightfully so. And uh, when you say the higher guys got off, I, I mean, think the, the, the commanding level? general, the, the, the brigade they commander. Went up that high, you think? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, the battalion commander. My understanding, because of having been there and knowing how operations were formed, the order to do what was have would have, would have had to have originated at battalion level because they were the ones that coordinated the airlift that would have brought the troops in. Mm -hmm. So they had had to have come from that level, come to the come to the company commander. The battalion commander, between when that happened and when the, the, the peers investigate, had been killed in accident. So he was he was not he was dead. Mm -hmm. So he they mm -hmm. they had no way of interviewing him or you know no way of determining what he had what he had to say. Uh, the the captain right above Kelly was prosecuted. Yeah, Medina, Medina Medina was still Medina, Medina was still was well, he was prosecuted in that and and basically uh, I used to use that as an, an example of what we call commander's intent. Is what did he mean? Uh, I had guys, again, from, it's secondhand from what I'm telling you, but it's firsthand coming to me because I had guys who were actually in the meeting before they took off the next day to go to me live, tell me that what Medina told them was, in the direction was a Cali, was that he was coming in on the second lift of ships and that when he got there, he did not want to see a single Vietnamese in the village alive. Now, he didn't tell people to do whatever they did. He just, he let them figure out what they thought he meant. And that was ultimately his escape when being court-martialed because nobody could say he gave a direct order for them to go in and kill people because he didn't. He just, because you could have accomplished the same thing by clearing everybody out and just, you know, destroying that the that village. That could have been might have what he meant. Uh, it could have been what he meant. You know, nobody knows and you can't really say what he meant. Uh, so that was the one thing is when, you know, when you're given instructions like that, one, it, 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 you need to understand what the person giving you those instructions, what does he mean? And you can question them. And, you know, in terms of wars, this wasn't the same any time it happened. My wife's uncle was in World War II in Third Army and he had an encounter with Patton where Patton basically told him the same thing to do and he didn't. But, you know, mm. but, you know, it was, you know, it, it was it was the intent. As, uh, I mean, well, yeah. as I, there was a helicopter pilot who yeah. uh, and his crew who flew Hugh in. Hugh Thompson. Uh, he was Thompson. in my unit. Oh, was uh, he? Yep. His name. Do you know the story? Yeah. What he did? Yeah, but you tell it. Uh, well, he landed his helicopter in between the, the people that were shooting and the civilians in the in the city and at Milai. At Mi Milai, and then went back. And after he got it, everybody stopped shooting. Um, he went back and re reported it. Uh, more to it than that. Oh, I mean, that's, I that, mean in terms of his own personal courage. Um, I, I think he, had, he he was threatened, but uh, I don't remember some of the subtleties of it. Well, it, according to the Ken Burns documentary, mm -hmm. <laughs> he actually ordered his crew. Uh, he called for ceasefire, and he ordered his crew: if they don't cease fire, then fire on. He had one crew member. He was flying an OH-23. Yeah. So was he officer. recognized for that act? Uh, later, later on, he, he received the Soldier's Medal, which is a uh, medal for non-combat uh, uh, humanitarian type of um, mm -hmm. to yeah. work, and he got his Air Medal. And he was recognized, uh, mm -hmm. and he was interviewed, and he was acknowledged as somebody that uh, stepped up at the right time. It was a courageous right thing. Yeah, it was. Because it was. it's not yeah, every I don't know. day a soldier countermands an operational. Uh, well, he wasn't working. Yeah, yeah. He, first of all, he was two different units, and sometimes there's a gray area, who's in charge and who you're going to listen to. But I don't know if I, I would have done that. I, I think I might have gone back and reported it, but I'm not sure I would have parked my helicopter in between the guy firing a machine gun and the civilians and told my crew to do that. But I definitely would have reported it, which is what he did. After it was all settled, he goes back. But that it took two years for, for, the, for it to percolate up to get to somebody to be reported uh, and for an investigation to occur. Well, I want to talk a little bit about your experiences as a helicopter pilot, first with Hueys, 
in your first tour, and then uh, secondly with the Chinooks. Uh, what a great CH opportunity for a 21-year-old kid uh, to, um, uh, to sightsee. I joined the Army when I was 19, graduated from flight school when I was 20, uh, got to Vietnam on the 3rd of January, 19, uh, as you, yeah, 3rd of January, 1967, and um, immediately started flying. And uh, you're a kind of a co-pilot for the first three or four months till you get experience. Then you get promoted to aircraft commander. So I probably got promoted to aircraft commander around April or May of 67. But, uh, and you're in charge, a 21-year-old guy in charge of a helicopter. You're the aircraft commander. You're in charge of the crew, the mission, the, the armament, the care and feeding of the, uh, of the aircraft itself. How large is the crew of a Chinook? Uh, well, the, uh, my first tour was a Huey. Yeah. And they were, there, there was usually three, well, four. Uh, aircraft commander, co-pilot, gunner, and crew chief. And a Chinook, five or six, depending upon the mission. Yeah. Now, my second tour, I flew CH-47s, uh, which is a totally di different environment. Uh, I was a couple years older, uh, flying with a lot of a lot of guys in the Chinook companies were on their second tour, so there was a mature bunch of folks. Why is that? Um, because uh, they looked for more experienced people that had more hours, more skills, more... Uh, flight experience to go into the CH-47 track as a track. More it's complicated a, aircraft. More complicated aircraft. It's got twin engines, six rotor blades, a um, lot of systems. And I showed you the office, the cockpit. You had to know that aircraft. It was like flying an airliner. Yeah. My only problem flying Chinooks is you were a bigger target and it seemed like bigger guns were shooting at bigger yeah, Less target. maneuverable probably than a Huey. Yes, it is, but I, I mean, you got to honk that baby around. You could do it. Uh, my second tour... And I think, I'm not sure it's on the map, there's a place called Camduck. Yeah, I'm sure that. Um, it's there. Uh, it's way, it's, way uh, uh, it's south of the Ashaw Valley, west of uh, Chu Lai. It's, it's not on the map, but it's back up in this area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was a Special Forces camp that was put in. I landed there a couple times in 1968 uh, with the Special Forces. Never thought about it. It got overrun in um, uh, this is May, summer of 67. It got overrun in May of 68, they're in the small tet, and lo and behold, in July of 1970, the second Arvin Division, because we're going into Vietnamization, uh, goes back in to Cam Duck to secure it uh, because of infiltration coming in off the border. And um, I, I got a Distinguished Flying Cross for resupplying uh, some artillery ammunition there. there. And I, it was one of those cases where uh, I never heard the Pathfinder abort the mission. There was an a, a Army um, advisor, a Pathfinder, on the ground with an FM radio. My call sign was Hercules 2-6. And he, said, he kept saying, because the fire was so much, he kept saying, Hercules 2-6, abort, go around. And apparently I was so focused on landing, I, I really didn't hear him. And if I would have heard him, I probably would have aborted and go around. But what I did is I, I, I landed a bunch of ammunition for a, a 105 howitzer that the, uh, that the Arvin gun crew was able to turn around and fire port blank in the side of a mountain to, to knock off the 12.7s uh, that were firing mm -hmm. and some of the rocket propelled grenades that were coming in. Yeah, those, those 51 caliber uh, guns that we saw earlier were pretty common then. Uh, yeah, uh, well, common for anti-aircraft. It, it, it was a Chinese version of a, of a Soviet uh, uh, automatic weapon, which was originally uh, designed uh, for ground-mounted um, operation and on a tank but it made a pretty doggone good artillery weapon. But the rounds were about that big, uh, the, and the slug was about that big, yeah. and um, it could do a lot of damage. Uh, so that didn't there. sound like a milk run? That no, no, thing. that was one of those instances where I, I, there was a little <laughs> stuff going on. Uh, my flight engineer was wounded. Uh, the aircraft was shot up. Uh, I, I had to go back and switch it you around. You shot up by this 51 caliber. Well, I, I think, I'm not sure what I got hit with. Uh, there was some small arms fire, there were some RPGs going off, uh, and there were some mortar rounds going I mean, there was just a lot of stuff going on. Uh, but it was time for me to get out of there. So I flew back to Chulai thinking, okay, my day's done. And my company commander comes out and says, okay, Tom, uh, uh, we got an aircraft here ready. Uh, go crank this bad boy up and uh, head back out there. And I'm like, well, I don't think I'm ready for that. I did. You know, you never turn down a mission in front of your guys. It was all that part of that machismo of, you know, strap it on, John Wayne, and uh, let's ride into battle. Let's, so we did, and it, it, was, it was nothing happened. A lot, of, a lot of the stuff was over by that time. But uh, uh, Milt probably has experiences where you didn't want to let your buddies down. Yeah. 
and you didn't want to look bad in front of your buddies. So sometimes you said things like, can do boss, will co, put me in coach, you know, even though your stomach's churning up and you, you kind of really don't want to do it, you just kind of, yeah. okay, okay. Like I said, combat's for young guys. <laughs> Milton and I wouldn't be doing anything like that nowadays. But you know, you're young, dumb, they gave you a gun, taught me how to fly a helicopter, let's go. Um, and it seemed like it was all part of the, of the day job. Well, you had one run that took you to hell and back. Almost took you to hell and left you there. Oh, well, I, I got shot down my first tour on the 22nd of November of 67, uh, dropping off Special Forces guys just north of the DMZ out of Quezon. And I landed in front of a 12.7. Now, somebody's going to say, well, that was pretty stupid. Why did you, why did you do that? My, 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 um, the the anti-aircraft. Yeah, the, the lead aircraft. There's two Hueys and, and two of our gunships. Lead Huey went in and he says, hey, Tom, I received some small arms fire from, let's say, the east. So you better come in from the west. So, so I circled around. I came in. It was just enough time for to wake up this gun crew, and I'm, and I'm at about 15 feet coming in. I'm I'm looking out, and all of a sudden it, it just seemed like there was, there was this black stick sticking out of a bush, and I from saw. How far away? Uh, 25, 30 feet. It's pretty close. Wow. And I and and I I I, I just remember for some reason when I think about it, slow motion, boom, boom. Boom, took out the cockpit, took out the windscreen, hit my co-pilot, hit uh, my gunner, lost control of the tail rotor, finally hit the engine. Uh, I just got minor wounds out of it. Um, and then when I lost the tail rotor, it spun around the top of the hill and I dove down. Now all the guys got off except one. Uh, there was an American Special Forces guy, a Vietnamese Special Forces guy, and, so, and four Nungs. And Nungs were Chinese mercenaries, little guys, but they were just meaner in hell. Um, and we crashed into bamboo. Our guys. Yeah, he was, our guy, the, the Nungs, and I, it was a tribe of, of, of uh, near they were, Laos. They were ethnic Chinese, actually, what they were. Yeah. Uh, but anti-communist. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 they were on yeah. our side, and they were well, mean the, little yeah. SOBs. But then the Nung is, Nung is their word for farmer. Oh. Okay. Uh, like Montagnard is, uh, in French, French. is, is uh, mountain, mountain, pe mountain, yeah. mountain uh, people. Mountain people, yeah. yeah. Uh, we crashed in the bamboo, big bamboo thing. I didn't know it was bamboo. I was just trying to maintain control of the aircraft, and that which saved our life. Bamboo is so resilient that the aircraft hit it and actually bounced up, turned over. Of course, I, everything's going to hell in a handbasket in my brain about that time, and pounce, points back up on the hill. So I'm hearing the engine wind down. I'm he, the rotor blades have snapped off. Um, the, I, I, my butt's gone through the seat. My knees are up on my chest. I'm thinking, hey, I finally get to pull the emergency handle. I never, we're never allowed to touch that. And I thought, well, what am I doing that when the windshield's gone? So I crawl out the windshield. We, we assemble our crew, some small arms fire is going on, counter weapons, who's doing what. And, and then the, the, the Special Forces guys on the hill, the first team of six that landed, and the five guys I left up there, all 11 of them, hustled down the side of the hill. I don't know how they did it. 15 minutes later, it seemed like, or it seemed like overnight, but it was more like 15, 20 minutes later, they run down and they're secure in part of the uh, LZ. And uh, a Vietnamese helicopter tried to come in and pick us up. Couldn't get into where we were at, so we had to go through the bamboo. I'm the first one through the bamboo, not that, not that I was running faster than anybody else. Uh, and I, I burst out of the bamboo, and it's, it's an H-34, uh, Sikorsky uh, older helicopter. And I remember the call sign, it was King B, because we had worked with these guys before. And the guy's got a 30 caliber machine gun, an old 30 caliber out the door. And he fires a burst at me, because all of a sudden somebody comes, you know, springing out of the bamboo, and, and uh, he's, his hands are on the trigger. Now, luckily, they went about 15 feet over my head, but uh, he picked us all up and took us back to Quezon to, to the aid station. I don't know what happened to the other 11 guys. I think some other aircraft came. And probably Why didn't got... it explode? Why didn't your Sikorsky? Ex I mean, your uh, the Huey? Huey? Uh, don't know. It uh, didn't catch on fire. Um, they didn't hit the fuel cell. Um, that wasn't our lady friend, was it? Foxy lady? No, that was my second tour. Um, um, but the name of the aircraft? Mustang Sally. <laughs> that was a popular song at the time. And you had to blow her up. Yep. Yeah, I, I don't know whatever. She's a Hulk. What if there. that bamboo had not been? What if you not landed on that bamboo? I think we would. That, that it might have stuff. exploded then. But the bamboo being as resilient, it, it, it just cushioned everything. Yeah. Was this your come to Jesus moment? 
it was close. I actually pulled my 38 out thinking I was going to have to uh, defend the perimeter with a pistol. Uh, but I thought I was on the ground for five minutes, and later on my wingman told me I was on the ground for over 45, 50 minutes. We, uh, totally, total. But it just seemed like everything was happening really fast. Because I've heard the opposite before, that you think it's lasting mm -hmm. forever and it's a shorter time. In my experience, it lasted, it seemed like a short time, but actually it was a longer experience. It was probably because I was so stupid and dumb that I had, I, I forgot where I was at or what I was doing uh, at the time. But spent the night. Now, the three of my crew members got messed up pretty bad. They were evacuated. I was on the same evacuation as a, a C-123 that left Quezon for Da Nang. They went uh, into the into surgery. They, the only reason I spent a night in the hospital is because of waiting for a flight home. So I spent the night in the hospital, but, which I really didn't have to, which, which was kind of creepy because I, I, I wasn't hurt that much. Um, but I never... Any fatalities in your crew? No, no. Now, the, the, um, the Vietnamese sergeant that was on the aircraft was killed in the crash. Somehow when the aircraft... Because, see, we were all strapped in. The gunner... He was hanging on, must have been hanging on for dear life because he didn't get off the aircraft. And somehow when we flipped over, he came out of the aircraft and the aircraft crushed him. I finally get back to my unit and my boss says, uh, take the day off. I says, okay. That night I couldn't sleep. I was so wired. I remember trying to sleep and it, my eyeballs were that big and, and, and I, I just, I tossed and turned all night and morning came up and I went to breakfast and I, and I was still kind of wired because he had allowed me to take the rest, you know, the next day. I actually, I asked him, I says, hey, I'm not well. I, I need to, I need to, sure. I need to take some time off. So I gave me the day off. And later on that afternoon, I took a nap and I finally got back. In. And the next day I was back in the saddle. So, so Master, go fly. Okay. Well, that's what you do. You yeah, no, no, yeah, I'm young, dumb, but, and they gave me a gun, you know, so. By that time, are you, are you thinking either... I've used up all my luck here, or I'm bulletproof? Oh, you know, there was a saying we used to have, hey, it's going to happen to the other guy. You know, that was kind of a joke. There was a song we used to sing sometimes after drinking, it's going to happen to the other guy. It ain't going to happen to me. It's going to happen to the other guy. It's going to happen to Milt. It ain't yeah. going to happen to me. Well, who was it in the, the guy that was uh, they were interviewing in the Ken Burns documentary, The Marine, hmm. who said uh, everybody thinks they're special? Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, he said, uh, "You know, I, I put special guys in body bags all day long, and parts of guys in body bags all day long." Yeah, that was, was the special. other. That was the other guy. Hmm. Like, yeah. like, okay, that was the other guy. That was the when, other guy. It was the other guy. No, yeah. you didn't wish anybody ill, but it was just kind of a saying. Yeah, I'm okay. That's going to happen to other guy. Milt, you have a come to Jesus moment over there. So, you know, I mean, that was, and we were out on combat patrols all the time. Anything could have happened. Uh, nothing did. So, you know, it's kind of like, okay, uh, you know, it's kind of one of those things, and, and it happens in combat because you see that all the time is, is there's no explanation for why somebody is hit, no explanation for why somebody isn't. And you just say, okay, well, you know, in my case, it's why, why, was, why was I spared? This is like I talk about, you know, Tom's got purple heart. I don't have a purple heart which is relatively rare for an infantryman. Mm. And, uh, you know, so I have to say, I mean, I joke about the fact is I knew when to duck, but, you know, the real truth is that, you know, could have been, you know, you're talking about coming to Jesus. It could have been, could have been that I was, I was being protected also. And the company next to him could have been mauled. And oh, yeah. the battalion across the other hill could have been shot up. But there, there, I know of aviation units that were taking casualties all the time. Uh, uh, and it goes back to this milk run thing where, uh, you know, milk's probably walking through the rice paddies and nobody's shooting for, for days on, a couple of days. And then all of a sudden it happens. Uh, it's not like a war movie where it's constant combat all the time. And uh, there's always close calls and there's people that are lucky and there's people that are unlucky because that's the other guy. Well, but by the same token, it's not like... World War II, where you're either at the front or you're in gay Paris. I mean, it, 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 it it's everywhere. In uh, Vietnam, it was every. It could be anywhere. You could, you could be in the rear area working on a truck and not a combat soldier in, in the combat zone and some yehu fires a couple of rockets in there and, 
and you're you're killed in a base camp. You're killed in in, in Chulai. Mm -hmm. Chulai. There was an area uh, just uh, uh, west of uh, of Chulai, along in between a low set of hills and some mountains. They used to call the rocket pocket because uh, the bad guys would run through there, set up rockets, either 140s or 122s, and they'd put them on sticks, and they, they were just very inaccurate. And light fuses are put by candles, so by the time they were gone, the rockets were going off. And um, uh, the, the, uh, the only woman that was killed in combat was killed at Chulai by a rocket uh, in the rear area, a nurse, in a, in a hospital. I mean, technically in the rear area. Yeah. And she was killed by a rocket. So uh, it's kind of like Afghanistan and Iraq. You know, you're, you're in a convoy uh, and somebody's going to shoot at you. Uh, you're at the PX. I've heard stories of guys at the PX. Uh, matter of fact, um, um, a sergeant first class at the base, at the Joint Forces Training Base, was at the PX buying hair products and her back was turned. A couple of rockets went off and she was wounded in the back of the head and was hospitalized. At the PX? At the P in the PX, in the rear area in the PX. Yeah, uh, right. I want to ask you, uh, as we come down to the last few minutes of our, our we can't go on forever, guys. <laughs> I'd like to. Do, do either of you, and I'll just open it up to the table, have particular faces that you see when you, when you go back, when you, in your mind, when you go back to Vietnam, 68, 69, yeah, particularly someone that was lost over there? Or... The guy that graduated next to me, I'm, I'm L-A-S-S-E-R, he was L-A-T-A-T-I-N-I, -I, Jerry Latini from Columbus, Georgia. We wound up in the same unit together, in, in the same tent together, and uh, he was killed one night. Uh, the whole air, he was shot down by 12 point, Seven millimeter anti aircraft gun dropping. That 51 caliber again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 and uh, dropping flares one night. And I, I think about him occasionally. I saw his name on the wall. I visited the wall some years ago and mm -hmm. just checked it out. Uh, but I don't, it's like I don't have bad memories. I don't, I don't ponder stuff like that. So far back in, in, in my brain that, uh, I, I, that doesn't disturb me. I, I don't. I don't think about it. Speaking of the wall, you went back in Washington, D.C., and what was your impression of it? June 19, Not everybody is no, a fan. June 1984, <clears throat> I had a moment. I didn't think it was. But when I walked down there, looking at there, and I, and I saw a couple names, I had a moment. My wife didn't come down there with me. She stayed up front, and, and she told me that I, I, I didn't cry or anything, but I... I had a moment, and I didn't. I didn't expect it. I, I didn't. I thought it was above that, but it was a somber experience. Yeah. And especially when I saw Jerry's name, uh, a couple other guys I knew, and I think, in a way, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm healthy. There were some guys that were vulnerable that saw more stuff than I did, or that Milt did, that had issues, uh, where maybe that's therapeutic. By going back and you know smelling the air, I never. I remember my second tour. I landed at uh, Cameron Bay. No, I landed at um, Tom Sanut, and the and a DC-8 opened up the doors. And in a couple seconds later, you smelled the musky, damp air. And I thought to myself, "The hell am I doing here again?" You know, that was a that was another moment. Like, look, and I volunteered for my second tour. Yeah, I'm thinking, well, let me think about this again. Well, too late. <laughs> yeah. Of course, that was post Tet Offensive, and things. Yeah, were, I watched the Tet Offensive start at uh, uh, Fort Stewart, Georgia. I think it was the 30th or the 31st of January. Yeah, but yeah, but that, and I'm checking into BOQ, turn on the TV, and whoa! Did I miss a, a big party? That's so I kind of lucked out. You saw it that way. I saw it on TV, <coughs> like no, like you everybody. You saw it as a big party, something uh, you wanted to be part of. Uh, kind of. Again, I, I, I kind of. I, my first thought that came to mind. What about my guys? What about what happened to the unit? You know, what are they okay? You know, uh, but you know, I, I think soldiers think that part of being a soldier is being close to the guy on your left and close, to, being close to the guy on your right. That team, you know, you, you're not going to let your buddies down. You're looking out after them. 
with the anticipation that looking after you and that kind of what kind of keeps you going. Uh, and it's that bond, whether it's humorous or it's macabre or uh, it's, it's a drunken uh, thing on the beach. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it's part of being a soldier is, is that, that, that bond. And it's going to happen to the other guy. Yeah, not going to be you. Not going to be me. It's going to happen to the other guy. You're special. Yeah, and don't ever forget it. <laughs> Milt, what do you when you go back when you rewind not not to your present not right, your right, recent yeah, yeah. Uh, tour of Vietnam uh, as as a what what uh, Tom lightly refers to as a tourist <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but when you were you did two tours also right did you second guess yourself on the second tour what am I doing here I well concert. I had a different situation because. <clears throat> the first tour, I was enlisted. I got drafted. I was enlisted, and, and I was supposed to go to OCS, but typical Army fashion, somebody forgot to put a hold on my personnel file, and so I ended up in Vietnam. And then they, when I got to Vietnam, they said, oh, you were supposed to be in OCS. The, the question, you want to go back? And I said, well, you know, what more can they do me? So, yeah, I said, yeah. But so I, that, that first tour was there. So I, it was two different venues, and so I really didn't have a choice on the second time either because, the you know, when I got, after I got OCS and got commissioned, then what you did to typically was you spent a stateside tour as a second lieutenant, and then you got went back to Vietnam as a first lieutenant, and that was just the, that was the routine. That, that was the that, deal. You know, that you'd was go the, back, that was the deal. Second tour, you'd go back as an officer. <clears throat> yeah, so I went back as, as a second tour. If you know the, the plus side of of the process for me was uh, I was on the MACV compound and way, and I would have been there for Tet of sixty eight if I'd mm -hmm. completed my enlisted tour. Mm -hmm. So I. <laughs> I avoided that by coming back and becoming part of getting, you know, going through OCS and getting a commission. But at the same time, and, and, you know, I mean, I knew guys that I served with in Way and that were basically uh, one of them, one of the guys that I work with uh, was in one of the front bunkers and he spent three days in the bunker before he could get out because was, you just, you know, you were stuck. You know, the combat was such that you were, we were stuck. This is the big battle in uh, for yeah, the in a way, yeah. yeah, and for the MAG, you know, the, the MAG V compound. And it was interesting because the, the Ken Burns flashes the MACV compound a little bit like that. And it's like, oh, yeah, okay, I can remember that. I didn't bring some of the pictures. I, mean, I had some, I have some pictures of the MACV compound when I was Define there. Define MACV for me. Military Advisory Command Vietnam. Yeah, they were everywhere, weren't they? They were the they headquarters. Were the, they were the headquarters. They were the, they were the, they were the supreme military command structure. So everything... You know, the commander of MACV was the commander, essentially, of everything in Vietnam. Westmoreland. Yeah, Westmoreland and okay. Abrams. All so right. that's, that's, that was their role. It's out, out of those off <clears throat> offices that come the infamous daily body counts. Yeah, they were the uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, what they call the that. five o'clock follies they used to call. Whatever, yeah. yeah, whatever. And the, you know, the, the comparisons of body counts. And, well, we won the battle because the body count was 10 to 1. Mm -hmm. The, the, the military factor of the war is is still existent today, and, and to some extent, Afghanistan is probably. And I, when I talk to UCLA, Afghanistan really is closer to Vietnam than Iraq was. Iraq is, was more of a conventional war. Yeah. Or, uh, Afghanistan is more in terms of, of insurgents, etc., and, and you know the people and the structure of the land, etc. What they so now call asymmetrical warfare. Yeah. So, so that was, uh, there's a difference there. The problem in Vietnam from a military standpoint, motivation, et cetera, beside, is you never win a war defending territory. And that's really what we were doing. I mean, you know, we would never have won, the only way we could have won the Vietnamese war, you know, from our standpoint, was figure out how to, how to invade North Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Because you, if, if, if you were sending, defending, you defending against them, you couldn't, you couldn't have done that. And so... You know, and this was this was saying. I mean, if you look at, you know, Rome won the war with Carthage by attacking Carthage. They couldn't they couldn't pin Hannibal down in in in, in Italy, mm -hmm. so they attacked where he came from. Yeah. <clears throat> it seems like, of course, you know, here we are, Americans. We you know we we get on a plane from you know we have a pizza, you know, and a coke, and kiss our girlfriends goodbye. And we fly on an airplane and we land in a country that is 180 degrees opposite of what, we're, what we know. And yet it was their backyard. Mm -hmm. I, I remember the story, um, 
from the Ken Burns documentary about the VC, the, the, maybe he was NBA, saying, look, all we did was stay hid and, and follow their cigarette butts. <laughs> he said the Americans love to smoke and they'd flick their cigarette butts out and, and keep marching. We just follow their cigarette butts till we found them and we killed them. So who's smarter? Well, you know, I mean, I, I think Ken Burns is accurate in, in, in is, is that, that we totally underestimated the Vietnamese. We didn't give them credit for who they were, what their capability was. And, but that's not the first time. We've, historically, that's an American attitude. And when, when we're fighting anywhere, is, is that we're the only ones that know the right answers and, and you know, everybody else doesn't. So, you know, that part of but that, that part is true. Uh, you could tell where the Americans went by basically the trail of trash they left behind them. Mm -hmm. I, it wasn't hard. I, one of the villages that I work with was, what I mentioned, is a, a village called Yavak. There was no Americans there, which was really ra very rare, okay? Well, one of the features of that particular village was the fact that it was immaculate. There was you know, absolutely no trash whatsoever. I mean, it was pristine, clean. And they, and they kept that, and that's the Vietnamese did that. Anywhere you found Americans, you know, there's a trail of, trail of trash. Well, I, I guess what's really important about the end of our conversation <clears throat> is, is uh, you know, I'm not going to sit here and try and debate with you guys what kind of war it was or whether we, you know, who won the war. It's, it's kind of silly and preposterous for me to, you know, present that argument to you. But I think it does matter to all of us as Americans. What did we learn that we can apply? You're military guys. You've stayed military guys all of your life. You think like military men. Is there anything we learned from Vietnam we can apply to Afghanistan, for example? Uh, I think it's tactics and strategy. Uh, as soon as the Vietnam War was over, we forgot everything we learned about counterinsurgency and a guerrilla warfare, and we focused on the big red threat in Europe, and the whole army then focused on uh, land combat um, in uh, Germany against Russia. Uh, the army's slow to learn. It's a big bureaucratic organization. You don't... You don't uh, uh, take that observation experience and turn it into uh, doctrine overnight. Uh, as a country, um, we tried to do the right thing. We, there, you know, there was this thing called the domino theory and it actually started happening a little bit right afterwards. Uh, I think we overcommitted ourselves piecemeal and um, like Milt said, the, the way to win that war probably would have been to go into North Vietnam, which would have dragged, dragged in the Chinese and complicated our, our, our NATO relationship. Um, but it's statesmanship first and uh, war second. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'd like to think that we're pretty good at statesman, statesmanship, but um, war is when you... you uh, um, the failure of statements. Yeah, yeah. When you, when you, yeah, all the other options are are are, are, are gone, and uh, people stop talking, and they get angry, and uh, and traditionally, not just Americans. This is this is human nature, I think, over the over the centuries of how people react when they're either backed into a corner, or they back the other guy in the corner, and they're going to take advantage of them. Well, let me give you a shot at that question. Have you thought about what you know? What lessons? What would I do differently as a commander? As a, as a company commander. Um, if I were in now Afghanistan, found myself in Afghanistan, are there lessons you could apply? That was an, Vietnam was our first asymmetrical war. Right. Can, what can you bring, what, can, what meaning can we bring out of that <clears throat> defeat that we can apply elsewhere? Um, I don't know, I mean, for me personally. The, as a unit the, commander, the, as, as a commander, you know, I mean, you lead with the, you lead with your own personal styles, and I don't think the style I would I would have used in Vietnam and the style I would use in Afghanistan would have been any different because, you know, that's the kind of person I am. I I can't influence the whole military, and and that's really where the the overall the overall uh, problem comes in is 
is you're talking about, to some extent, changing a military culture. And that can be changed, but it doesn't change fast. Uh, so you, you need, uh, and some of it is, is just, uh, you know, we talked about earlier, the, the, our American elitist attitude. Uh, you know, you have to, if you're working in an environment like, like we were in Vietnam or like you are in Afghanistan, I, you have to begin. You have to take some time to understand who the people are that you're dealing with, and otherwise you're never going to be successful. I think in Vietnam we needed the military there. To, in, in Afghanistan, the same. You need the military there to protect the people who are doing the the real work, which of, of, of the humanitarian the work. humanitarian work, and and that's really what it what it is, because the if you really want to win the war, ultimately you have to get the, the their culture to 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 come in, in in terms of, of, of appreciating the humanitarian effort of it because, you know, without schools to educate their children and without the hospitals and without all of these kind of things that would, you would be dealing in a humanitarian, um, their, 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 their civilization is not going to survive. So when your company went out and was inoculating people and, and providing medical mm -hmm. services, I mean, that was half the battle, wasn't it? Oh, so, yeah. Hearts and minds. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm reminded, um, the point, you know, is we're sorely reminded of this point. I read just two days ago in the paper, I'm reading. I don't know if you guys got this, caught this article, but um, Special Inspector General for the Afghanistan Reconstruction just issued a report last week. I mean, just to bring everything back to today, talking about Afghanistan. Our longest war hmm. in history. Uh, John F. Sopko, Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction. United States failed to understand in Afghanistan the complexities and scale of the mission required to stand up and mentor security forces. Sound familiar? Hmm. Um, we, governments attempted to implement a one-size-fits-all for building that security force, which we found out once we left, you know, mm -hmm. not to disparage the South Vietnamese soldier, as you mentioned earlier, he was a honorable, they were honorable men. Mm -hmm. But he says that the U.S. government lacks a, a deployable police development capability. We weren't training them for, you know, support infrastructure. They interviewed, a con they've left it up to the contractors to do. I don't know how many contractors we have more, in Vietnam. More than military. Really? Mm -hmm. Even in Vietnam? Oh, no, in no. Vietnam. I, I was talking about Afghanistan. A lot of con We had contractors uh, my, uh, doing maintenance on our aircraft. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and sure. and they're the ones that uh, did most of the, the, the work on building the ports and mm -hmm. the roads and stuff. Okay. But we have more in, in Afghanistan. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. We're all aware. And he interviewed a number of them. And in his article, he refers to few of them, civilian contractors, the report continued, who said uh, to U.S. officials um, that the way that they formulated some of their policies toward the civilians, uh, they reached their conclusions by watching TV shows like Cops and NCIS to learn how they should teach. Hmm. Now, this is a report from the Special Inspector General, mm -hmm. United States government on Afghanistan. It's not right. the Greenwich Village voice. So, I guess the opportunity we, you guys have, as Vietnam veterans, fighting our first asymmetrical war, which is what Afghanistan is also, is what would you do different? How would you fight this war differently? We're not doing all that well over there right now. Uh, the president is now talking about putting troops back into Afghanistan. So I'm looking for a lesson here from Vietnam that might apply. Well, the thing I was talking about is, is in order to be effective in the, in the, the, the change of culture, you, you need the combat troops there because somebody has got to protect the humanitarian personnel mm -hmm. that are doing the work. Um, attitudinally, I don't know, there's, there's a challenge with us in our own culture 
and that is, and, and we don't, I don't think we realize it ourselves. We're, we're trying to, we're trying to implement a democratic society over there. We don't realize ourselves how long it took us to become a democratic society. We expect them to do it in 10 or 15, 20 years, not realizing it took us over 100 years ourselves. And so, you know, those are the kind of things, uh, and whether, you know, whether America's got the will to basically stay with it for, you know, if it takes 100 years and, 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 and we're successful, whether America's got the will to stay on course for the 100 years or whether we're going to get tired of it. And I think that was from a Vietnam perspective. North Vietnam was betting on the fact that the American will would at some point in time give out and they were going to win because we would just get tired of doing what we were doing. And they were going to, they were going to keep at it until we got tired. And I think the same thing would happen would happen here. Yeah, there's, there's some different cultural. There's some different cultural uh, aspects of Afghanistan than than existed in Vietnam, but uh, you know, I would say that if there was a lesson learned from Vietnam, is, is the the biggest one is is that we really need to have a good understanding of who, in in the case of Afghan, we need to have a good understanding of who the Afghans really are, what makes them tick. Uh, and it's that's difficult for us to do because we have a, we we frame everything based on our own experiences and and, and you, you kind of have to climb out of that box. Tom, last thoughts on the subject? Well, you can't force democracy on on folks. Um, and if that if that's the lesson that's we're ta that we're talking about is. Um, uh, we need to think it out as a as a country, as an administration, as a, a strategy that we might be trying to pound a square peg into a round hole, and uh, maybe uh, we should back off a little bit. But having said that, what are the consequences if we back off? If we leave, what kind of void do we leave? What kind of consequences? Uh, uh, regionally and globally with our allies and our enemies, does it mean when we, if, if we were to pull out, I'm kind of thinking, let's stay at it, just let's get smarter at it. Let's, let's work this thing, let's work this issue out. And maybe there's egos and personalities in the way that I'm not aware of, but we have systems and programs that, that, that could work, but we can't force democracy on, on a tribal country that maybe doesn't want it. Well, we forced it on the Japanese. It was called the Marshall Plan. It well, pretty it, well. Well, the Marshall and in Germany and Italy, uh, it did, and and to some degree, and uh, um, uh, it, look what's <clears throat> happening in in Vietnam. They're they're turning into a uh, capitalist, thriving economy. Um, Oi doi. By by default, uh, yeah. because they lo they're looking around saying, I want that. How am I going to get that? Well, I'm going to do this. Yeah. And it's working, like I said, in, in, about, in about 10 years, there's going to be some kind of hybrid government going on, and it won't be pure communism. Maybe we need to invade them with McDonald's workers. I think, I bet they already got McDonald's. Oh, yeah, yeah they have a McDonald's. Right across the street from, from the, the uh, Notre Dame Cathedral <laughs> is a McDonald's. <laughs> so, well, we know we've won that one. Well, we're, we're, yeah, we're the fact is they were talking about the, our guide was talking about KFC, and there was like two or three other chains that were coming in. Oh boy! You know, so all these things are. Oh boy! So we're 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 invading them with pop culture. Oh boy! What can defeat pop culture? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> How can yeah. you fight with Britney Spears? Yeah. 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 So. Okay. Well, gentlemen, uh, thank you so much. Thank you for letting me uh, inside your military minds for an hour and a half. <laughs> um, I appreciate that. Very much. Uh, I know sometimes people in the military, uh, you know, don't like to talk to people who are not in the military. But I think it's important for all of us to hear what you guys have to say, past, present, and future. I thought as a kind of a fitting end, because we all see those faces in our minds. Um, and thank you for sharing your 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 friends. Uh, we all think about those people. I have a number of friends that, that we lost. I lost personal friends uh, in that war. So we want to honor all of those. Uh, you know, as, as Americans uh, 
some Americans have said, you know, no, we didn't win because the body count was 10 to 1. We only care about the one. Mm -hmm. So I think in, in that spirit, um, perhaps we should go out of the program with a short piece that we put together honoring those ones who uh, we can only think of in our memories from Vietnam. So thank you, gentlemen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your time and, Thanks, John. and your candid conversation. Yeah. And um, we're out. On a two-lane piece of Highway 97, north of Mount Shasta, stands a lone monument on the roadside. You'd miss it on your way up or down the grade if you weren't looking close. It leads you to a gravel road and out into the high desert a short distance to the living memorial sculpture garden and remembrance wall tucked away among the scrub pines the crickets, and the wind. A monument dedicated to American veterans of all wars. Some dozen or more metal sculptures, towering, sometimes 15 feet tall, standing against the wind, quietly, in dedication to all who served. It doesn't matter As you crawl through the night Doesn't matter if you ever get it right, there's a chance you'll be gone and will never know your name. Soldiers die every day. That flag you said you'd die for Where's the words you love to say Will they keep you warm at night Will they get you through the day When there's nothing left for heroes now that you There's nothing left for heroes now that you're home. Through the forest, across the desert sand, in the tropics, on some.
doesn't matter as you crawl through the night. It doesn't matter if you ever get it right. There's a chance.